Oh, hi, I didn't see you there. My name is Bliss Foster. Welcome to the analysis of Rick Owens' Spring Summer 2021 Flegathon. It's pretty common for me at the beginning of these runway show analysis videos to encourage everyone to go look at the actual runway show itself. And this time I have found a way to force you to watch the actual runway show itself. We're going to go ahead and start this by reading the show notes and looking at the actual footage from the runway show because it is especially important for this show. Usually it's just we want to make sure that we see the clothes and actually know what we're talking about here, but in this case the uh, the actual footage that Rick gave us for this is uh, of particular importance that you will soon find out. Rick is a total bro and gives us all of the show notes that he has for any of the shows that did have show notes on the uh, descriptions for the videos that he uploads to his channel on YouTube. Let's dive in and look at some clothes. The show notes read. I spend my summers on Venice's Lido, the site of Thomas Mann's novella Death in Venice. The main character, a writer aesthetically devoted to his craft, develops an obsession with a youth and ends up dying on the beach from cholera during an epidemic with desperately age-defying hair dye running down his face in the hot sun. The word quarantine originated from this area's medieval response to the bubonic plague. This women's runway show is presented in the piazza in front of the Lido Casino, a monumental 1930s rationalist palazzo that I walk by and worship every day on my way to the beach. Doing a digital show without an audience here with my intimate Italian design room crew from our factory two hours away feels cozy and truthful and spectacular all at once. My last fall runway shoulder freak out wasn't about power. It was about defiance, defiance in the face of threat. Black Grande Podre tailoring is oversized with sleeves ripped off of hulking shoulders. Straps allow the wearer to strip jackets off and cinch around waists as a beach bustle. And satin rib waisted bombers have shoulders that are an exaggerated middle finger to doom. I just might be leaning into a taste for the lurid that an undercurrent of threat and dread can inspire. Bubblegum pink and alarm red thigh high boots and leather micro short cutoffs add a garish note but these micro shorts can be transformed into waist defining belts with handy pockets that can be worn over simple jersey shifts. Also more civilized are architectural cotton poplin tunics and robes with sculpted capes and mantles in bonded wools and cotton poplin. Confections in silk chiffon with strict lines of tulle geo ruffles sprinkled with trailing gazar ribbons add a grim gaiety. Most of the leathers used in this collection are double-faced with minimal unlined construction, including a 0.8 millimeter thick Neapolitan produced juicy double-faced leather we call double butter. We did a Neapolitan gelato degradé stripe print on chiffon and crepe, extending it to knits. These knits will double up, peel up and down like a banana, covering or exposing at will. A group of fishnet tank dresses and hoodies have been developed from the masks used in fall winter 2012, Mountain. Jackets and shorts are presented in stretched denim surfaced with palettes custom made for us from recycled plastic. This woman's spring collection, as always, shares the same title as the men's, Phlegathon, one of the rivers of the inferno described in Dante's Divine Comedy. Not quite the center of hell, but on the way there. I used a soundtrack of Donna Summer's I Feel Love, remixed for me 10 years ago by Jeff Judd, my longtime music collaborator. This song has always been a reassuring and stabilizing anthem for me, but here it gets as dark and delirious as falling into a K-hole, fitting this moment perfectly. Copyright restrictions did not allow me to post it on YouTube, so I had to post a substitute version, but Donna went hard for the live show at the Lido. There is a lot to cover in those details, so we're gonna go ahead and get cracking and uh, dive straight in. Let's dive in. Let's begin with the name. Phlegathon is one of five rivers that exists in the underworld in Greek mythology. Like Rick pointed out, there is a reference to this in Dante's Divine Comedy, specifically the Inferno, uh, but there's lots of references to this river that stretch across lots of different pieces of ancient literature. Phlegathon is not the most important river in the underworld in Greek mythology. The one that gets talked about the most is the River Styx, of course. This is one that is uh, most defined by the fact that it is just full of fire. Greek mythology talks about the underworld very differently than we talk about it now here in like 2020. Uh, the whole of the underworld is not just filled with blazing flames and hot coals everywhere. So the fact that the Phlegathon is completely filled with fire makes it very, very different than a lot of other places in the underworld. Very scary. There's a few different uses and references to this river throughout mythology. The one that I think would be most useful for us to look at is uh, in the uh, play Oedipus by Seneca. 
That's the one that's the retelling of the play Oedipus Rex by Sophocles, which is the one about the guy doing his mom. Anyway, early in the play, the chorus describes that a plague has settled in Thebes, which is the city where the play takes place. Within the play, there is this actual line that says, quote, Phlegathon has changed his course and mingled sticks with Theban streams. That line is kind of confusing on itself off rip, but really what it's meant to relay is that a plague has made it where death has become a physical presence among people in the world. Death is no longer an abstract concept that's just kind of out there waiting for us each individually at some point. It has like entered down into earth and has become a physical thing, a plague. During the quarantine, Rick has done a lot of different video interviews with different publications because he's uh, kind of stuck like the rest of us. And in a lot of these, he takes a lot of time to talk about the COVID-19 situation. He talks about this in the show notes a little bit when he mentions that Venice was kind of the etymological source for the word quarantine. Etymological, Etymolo etymological. So before anything else, Rick is kind of acknowledging with the title of the show itself that death has become a physical thing that is around us. Death is the thing that is most on the whole world's mind right now. What does art do with that? What does fashion do with that? Uh, Rick kind of doesn't propose a specific solution to this, a very direct answer, but he kind of orbits around a couple of different thoughts as to what might be done about that, as we will see. This video gives us a really interesting perspective on the outfits in this runway show that we don't normally get from Rick or really from any fashion brand. There's no real point in this video where we get close-ups on the clothes, which is the whole point of runway show videos, right? Like the location is important and maybe you'll get like a big drone shot that kind of circles around the building that they're hosting it in or kind of shows the entire landscape that everyone's walking in. But for the most part, the video's purpose is to do close-ups of the clothes. Here, most dominantly, Rick seems to be emphasizing the Lido Casino. The outfits and the walking models very much take a back seat to the emphasis that is the Lido Casino. Watch, like right now, someone is typing out a comment like, it's pronounced El Lido Casino. Yeah, Bliss, you may really want to lean into the Super Mario Bros accent with it. El Lido Casino. Wahoo! So in the show notes, Rick mentions that this absolutely stunning building is a piece from the Italian rationalist movement. Like all art movements, Italian rationalism was not about a single thing. It was multifaceted and it was about a lot of different things. But for our purposes here today, Italian rationalism was an architectural movement that saw the building of buildings as something that can be done using only reason. It talked about the creation of buildings being done like it's a science. Here's some other examples of other rationalist buildings. There's just no romanticism, no frills, just solve the problem like you would, say, cure a disease. In those video interviews that I was referring to earlier, Rick talks a lot about the fact that this is science's time to shine and that his job is to kind of stay out of the way and prepare for when it's his time for a contribution. So to put this very, very bluntly, the Lido Casino I think here represents science and Rick's work is art and the camera is kind of showing cultural perspective Art is still present, but it's waiting and allowing the emphasis to stay on what's important. This is science's time to shine. Alternatively, the building could also be the, uh, the pressing weight of everything that's going on in the world and Rick's clothes are responding to that. Because for most of us who are not like absolute obsessed devotees of Rick Owens, uh, Rick is a part of our lives. It's a small part of a bunch of larger concerns and worries that are going on in our lives. And Rick is kind of a voice that's a part of the general art consumption that we have. In one recent interview, Rick was talking about how French women's hats became more and more extreme during World War II as a way of subtly protesting against German occupiers. He said, quote, we can think of clothes as frivolous or we can think of clothes as one of the first steps towards communicating with other people, which is a powerful thing. Clothes don't change the world, but they're a part of an attitude that influences the way people think. They're signifiers, little messages people send to each other, like those hats. There's not a ton of items in the show that directly reflect the inspiration of French women's hats during World War II. I did see a little bit of a comparison between the structure of a pillbox hat and this kind of chest helicopter landing pad thing here. He doesn't really take things and then throw them up on a mood board and say, let's recreate this thing over here. He sees stuff himself and then he kind of bears the brunt and the weight of trying to interpret that to his design team and explain it to them. 
him. There's not a lot of copying, it's more an interpretation of something based on his memory of something. And whatever he's doing, it's working because this stuff is great. Let's move on and talk about shoulders. In the interview with the Federation of Haute Couture, he said, quote, my recent collections, I did very extreme shoulders. Shoulders are about power. What I was going for was defiance. These shoulders border on grotesque and comical, response to bigotry, my biggest fight. I want to create something that mocked conventional aesthetic rules. Those can be extremely bigoted, narrow, and cruel. My idea is proposing alternatives, not as another set of rules, but as a proposal that if you can't be naturally beautiful, I propose my kind of beautiful. It can be modest, but it can be artificial. I'm a big believer in artifice. Artifice doesn't have to be vulgar and it doesn't have to be false. It can be a sense of formality, it can be gracious, it can be bringing something generous to the table, end quote. Fighting against something that's as massive and intimidating as bigotry is a very tall order. But, I mean, he's right. This is the way that art moves through the world. Bigotry and conservatism have always existed, and they exist uh, less and less over time, which I feel like should maybe imply that there's a right and a wrong team to be on there. This stuff feels undefeatable. It just feels like this massive beast that exists in the thoughts and opinions of other people and that it's something that you can't ever really pull the roots out of for society. But the way that art has always handled that problem is just by consistently putting out stuff that flies in the face of those things and tries to fight them by being different. And I think he has a good perspective on that because he's not like saying, art is the most important thing ever. Look at these clothes. These clothes are going to solve the problem. He's putting all of that in perspective for us. He's showing us the, the importance of what we're all collectively thinking about right now, which is COVID. And he's putting his stuff there and saying, I'm still here, I'm still working, and I am waiting for the time when art kind of has its moment in the sun again. But for now, that's not what we're all focused on. And I think there's an element of that uh, defiance, that power feeling that he's communicating with the clothes and specifically the shoulders. There's gotta be an element of that that's referring to death. I mean, the, the inevitable mortality of everybody kind of building things that are showing this uh, sort of powerful defiance in the face of something that is as inevitable as death. I mean, the guy is 57. I'm 31 and I think about death. Like surely that is something that is at least in the back of his mind as he's designing this stuff that sort of stand up to the powerful void and say, I'm not scared of you. A lot of the shoulder pads of this specific collection seem to very closely resemble football shoulder pads. I mean, Rick is always working and reworking this like very complex, intricate shoulder thing that's I mean, mostly pretty ridiculous, but I think there's a lot of uh, fun things that we can pull out of that. It's not very often that he talks about previous shows in his current show notes, but here he, he definitely does. Talks about his uh, fall winter collection where he did the freak out, hulking shoulders back then, hulking shoulders now, and now we have these, uh, these torn off ripped sleeves from these hulking shoulders that really further emphasize this defiant power that he's trying to communicate in these clothes lately. There's one thing with the shoulders that I myself can't quite place. I mean, when he talks about shoulders in the show notes, we most readily jump to the ones here where we've padded the shoulders a whole lot and done this stuff here. I'm also really drawn to the shoulders on this piece specifically, where the uh, it's clearly a drop shoulder, but usually if a drop shoulder is going that low, they wouldn't bother to put a seam there anymore. But here that seam seems to be very, very well emphasized. And I'm not sure I fully understand like what that's supposed to be. Is it like someone who is like in their mech armor and have like pulled it out but kept the clothes on so the shoulders don't fully fill out anymore? I'm not really sure on this one. This one is really interesting. I like it a lot. We also have another really interesting shoulder detail over here where it's this kind of deconstructed almost like a, a cage crinoline for the shoulder all of the fill material has been removed and all we have is the skeleton of the structure of the shoulder pretty quickly when we're talking about power and defiance and like the symbolism of different elements of clothes it starts to get us to a place where there's not really a good way to describe it anymore it, it seems to, and I hate saying this you all know I hate saying this but it seems to kind of come down in a lot of cases to a feeling. And this season specifically really builds on that defiance power thing with the boots that are being introduced. I mean, we're digging into like full on like real life anime design with some of these. The heel, the shoulders, the line of the clothes, these seem to be the most crucial elements that a lot of designers are working with when they're creating a collection. And these are just, I mean, they, maybe these are the best shoes that Rick has ever put out. I mean, you look at these and you just want to like tug them onto your body and then just crush a pair of Ramones, right? 
I'm kidding, I'm kidding, we have fun. I mean, we've been building with kind of a new sort of boot from Rick since Larry, but these seem to be like the final form, like the ultimate Pokemon evolution of this kind of boot. Props to all the collectors that are able to line up that full series of evolution in their house. That would honestly make some really good wall art. This show is an ocean. Very deep, very wide, and we're nowhere close to being done with it yet. If you wanna check out the rest of the analysis of this specific runway show, you gotta go join the Patreon where the full episode sits. The link for that is down in the description. There's also an enormous amount of other content that you can check out there that's exclusive to the Patreon. Tons of new episodes that haven't ever been released and tons of extended episodes for lots of other runway analyses. I love all of you like Rick loves Michelle. I'll talk to you later.